So what happens to kids who leave third-rate public schools for the job market? They run into yet another government-imposed roadblock, the minimum wage. I used to work in a store like this. I didn't need a lot of back then either. I was 15 at the time, but I've been working since I was 10. As a shoeshine boy, dishwasher, fruit picker, and other odd jobs. But I wasn't the exception. My whole crowd worked. Back in those days, just about any kid who looked for a job could find one. Today, in ghettos like I grew up in, 70% of black children who look for jobs cannot find them. That's a shame. Because a first job means much more than pocket change. It's a chance for a start, maybe in a store like this. Most of the kids that you give jobs to, uh, they, they hold them for a long period of time here, you know, and, and I wish I could give more kids a job because I have kids constantly coming up to me asking me for jobs, you know, and I can't give them the jobs that I, that I wish I could give them. For a small employer to hire a young, inexperienced worker is a risk. The grocer who hired me could afford that risk. I only earn a dollar an hour, but that's all I was worth. I didn't have any experience or skills. Today, with an effective minimum wage of nearly $4 an hour, the risk of hiring a young, inexperienced worker may be too expensive to take. If there were a uh, lower minimum wage, I could hire maybe two or three more. The minimum wage law is a perfect example of the pattern afflicting poor black people today. The government, in an attempt to protect poor people, often creates new obstacles for them. In the 1950s, the minimum wage was only a dollar an hour. Given the price level at that time, that meant there was virtually no minimum. Starting in 1961, Congress began to push the minimum wage higher. In effect, the law forced teenagers to ask for more than they were worth. As it became more expensive to hire young workers, black teenage unemployment soared. By 1982, the effective minimum wage, including Social Security and other payroll taxes, was almost $4 an hour. And black teenage unemployment stood at nearly 50%. Other factors contributed, but the minimum wage did a lot of the damage. I'm going to be look out for three black males ages 12 to 14 years. The minimum wage may seem like a small thing, but if government had prevented me from working as a teenager, as it prevents so many kids today, it might have altered the entire course of my life. If at that crucial time, I had gotten into the habits of the street rather than the habits of working, I hate to think where I might be today. Of course, many black people have made it in recent years, especially those who have finished college and entered their professions. But many others, on the lower end of the scale, trying to get solid blue-collar careers have run into government roadblocks that work just like the minimum wage law. I drove a cab back in 1957 for a while. I made about $125 a week. The drivers in Philly now tell me they make about $250 a week. If they own their own cabs, they can make almost twice as much and be in business for themselves. But what stops them? It's the thousands of federal and state regulations that are imposed on the U.S. economy. In Philly, the number of cab licenses is restricted by law. That makes them scarce and expensive, almost $20,000 a piece at last count. If you can't come up with 20 grand, forget about driving for yourself. In Washington, D.C., you can get a cab license for less than $50. As a result, 90% of the D.C. cabbies own their own cabs, compared to less than 50% in Philly. Fares are lower, the drivers keep more, and of course, more people can get work as drivers. If a cab driver on, had to pay $20,000 for a cab here, uh, the poor cab drivers couldn't grab a cab. There are 10,000 cabs in D.C. Over 70% are owned by blacks. In New York and Philadelphia, blacks own less than 20% of the cabs. Government licensing closes the door to economic opportunity. Nearly a 1,000 occupations in the United States exclude people who do not have licenses. Sometimes the licenses cost money. Sometimes they require the applicant to pass complicated tests that have little to do with the job. Sometimes getting a license requires a friend in the business. All those licensing laws do just one thing, 
keep outsiders out. Those outsiders are often members of minority groups. Uh, back during the 30s and 40s, uh, there were practices uh, that, that were rampant in the South, particularly uh, in uh, the, uh, the former slaveholding states, uh, where blacks were specifically excluded by predominantly white unions. Example, electricians unions, plumbers unions, railroad firemen unions, and at that time, uh, the, the records of history will demonstrate that uh, it was the purpose of white unions to exclude uh, blacks, uh, mi uh, minorities in general, from the workplace. Uh, in fact, there were statements specifically made in connection with uh, occupational licensing regulations that if this law is successful, it will have the effect of reducing to a minimum the involvement of blacks, or Negroes as they were called then, in the workplace. This is the Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. Back in 1880, when Washington was still a segregated city, this beautiful building was built by black artisans, black plumbers, carpenters, and masons. And mind you, all working under black supervision. So are many other important public buildings in this city and in cities throughout the South. Today, that sounds remarkable. Even now, black people have a hard time breaking into the skilled construction trades. The fact is, in the late 1800s, black people were better represented in many of the skilled trades than they are today. Today, such blatant racism is illegal, and many union leaders would like to see more black workers in union jobs. But again, good intentions don't always produce good results. The effect of the government endorsing uh, collective bargaining and the closed shop concept within the union movement was that it uh, basically locked in place to a large degree for a generation or two to come uh, white domination of unions. And when you confer upon a union, in effect, monopoly rights to bargain collectively for the entire workforce, uh, they, in effect, can lay out the conditions, they can set the price uh, for their labor, uh, and they can control entrance uh, to that particular industry. Restrictive labor laws are just like minimum wages in some ways. In effect, they force inexperienced workers to charge more for their labor and thus keep them from competing for jobs. There are many examples, but one of the most infamous is the Davis-Bacon Act. Passed in the racist days of 1931, but still in force today. The Davis-Bacon Act is a 50-year-old law passed during the Depression, the purpose of which was to prevent employers from undercutting wages at a time when it was very much a seller's market in employment, a very high unemployment rate, and it was a Worker Protection Act. Now, it's very much outdated today because the Davis-Bacon Act, 50 years later, has become a Union Protection Act. The net effect of the Davis-Bacon Act today is that it favors union construction firms. Most blacks are in non-union construction firms or are independent tradesmen. Davis-Bacon excludes them from most government contracts. Of course, the government also has programs to help black people get jobs. Between 1960 and 1980, the government spent almost $90 billion on job training and jobs programs. 30 million people went through those programs. The result? Unemployment among the targeted groups went up, not down. Good intentions just don't cut it. It is morally outrageous for government to be cutting off the ambitions of those trying to climb the middle rungs of the economic ladder. Whether as cab drivers, construction workers, masons, or manicurists. After all, hope is the most important thing that people can have. But what good is hope? when people try to break out of poverty just to find that the rules of the game are stacked against them. And where do people end up after the government denies them chances for a decent education or a decent job? In the clutches of the worst government roadblock of them all, the dependency of the welfare system. 